And we're live. Woo <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I'm learning from you. <laughs> uh, it, this is uh, this is all very confusing. Um, more uh, view, people who know us from elsewhere may realize that I do a weekly show called the Oh No, Not Another Live Show with Christelle. Hence, she is the first uh, guest on this show as we work out all of the tech and all of the rest of it. Um, <laughs> Now, the general principle of this show is that we get an esteemed guest who can be a reader, uh, author, or um, just a generally interesting person who's read a lot of books. And we talk to them about their favourite books. Now, are you ready to, to talk a little bit about your books, uh, Christelle? Your favourite Tim, I am, but I want to know which category I fall into. Am I just... <laughs> well, you should. I mean... Um, <laughs> Uh, at the risk of getting told off by the, the the Amazon Variance Authority who monitor all of these things to make sure that no no brands are mentioned and people aren't trying to sell stuff off off Amazon. Um, you've got a book that um, at some point may be released, a children's book. That's my understanding. Absolutely. So. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to get this thing published. And you've been part of the journey. I mean, that's kind of how we actually connected though we were connecting before, but um, I'm trying to figure out how to actually get it published. And I had publishers interested at one point and then never heard from them. And I guess this is the journey of yeah. trying to get published. I had my illustrator looking into publishers um, at one point and then giving me a whole different approach. So I'm in that process. And I did it backwards. It's all a learning journey and I have no problem self-publishing. So that will be my next step. Um, but it is, a, it's different to self-publish an illustrated children's book. Yeah. Um, I mean, you picked basically the hardest kind of book to try and self-publish. So I've, so I've discovered. And yeah. so what I would love to do is find a children's book author who has self-published because it is quite complicated. Um, the pages yeah. have to be a certain way, which we did that. We were very aware of that when we did this. I called and got the what I needed to know. Pages have to be a certain size. There's different measurement. There's all this kind of stuff that you have to know. Um, but now to get it into book form, yeah, I'm learning. I am in the process of learning this. And that's good. That's how I learn. But eventually my children's book will be published. And the other thing is I've considered trying to publish it overseas first. Yeah. So actually in your side of the pond, Tim, before America. And I have a, several reasons for considering that, that we won't chat about today, but I've considered that as well. Seeing if I can get it published in the UK somewhere or elsewhere abroad. But so that's where I am. <laughs> okay. Well, shall we start talking about books? Because that's what this is supposed to be about. Um, we've had this like, like social moment. But let's talk about your first book, which um, the, it, it, it picks a random order for them. So yeah, to talk about any of them. But this I'm learning the, from you in book chat. Right. So the Midnight book. Library. Okay. So this is the most recent book that I read. And full disclosure... A lot of these books, I actually, my boyfriend actually reads to me. We read together. Oh. And so <laughs> I was laughing with him. I'm like, actually, I don't, you read them to me. It's almost like having my own, um, like audio, audio book. But yeah, well, this I is the most, Yeah. this is the most recent book that we read together. And um, it's Matt Higgs, who is, by the way, I don't know if you know uh, this author, Tim, he's UK based. He's a British author. Yeah, I think I follow he, him on Instagram. So, okay, I I've ever met him, but he focuses on mental health. He tells his own story of his mental health journey in social media, which I absolutely love. He's gained quite a bit of popularity. He can be quite controversial because I think anyone who talks about mental health can be, especially at the capacity he's been. Um, I think his Midnight Library is a number one bestseller already. And I think his next book is called 
I want to say the Compassion Project or Compassion, something like that. So I'm thoroughly intrigued by that one as well. Um, I do follow him quite closely. And I don't know about you, Tim, but when an author I look up to follows me back on social media, I get really excited. And Matt Haig is following me, so I'm I'm a little bit starstruck. By <laughs> when he um, followed me, I had a little freak out moment. So is what, what is this book like? Is it fiction or non-fiction? It's fiction. I mean, what, what, hap what happens in the book? Uh, I mean, okay, so in this spoilers, don't give it away, but uh, no, in this particular, the meat of this book is this particular book. It's called the Midnight Library, and I realized this past week being at a conference that it very much corresponds to something called the Midnight Hour. Yeah. And he re illustrated the Midnight Hour using the Midnight Library symbolically. Now, whether he did that consciously or not, I'm not sure. It seems like he may have, and he was very aware of what he was doing in this. And so... What what is the midnight hour for people like me who don't know? What the, midnight hour is? Hey, the midnight hour is talked about in spirit in some spiritual realms as yeah. one of the places you might go when you pass away, and it's the oh, last place okay. you go before you come back to Earth. Well, he illustrates that using a library symbolically. Like to me, it corresponded, um, and it made sense once I knew that. I didn't know this when I read when I read the midnight library. I didn't know that yeah. that was one thing talked about in that world, spiritual well, that realm of spiritual talk. I, I had never heard this before. And so there is something called the midnight hour. And it, like I said, it's the last place you go before you incarnate back to earth. Um, whether Matt knew that he was doing that or not, I'm not sure. It's To me, it makes sense. It seemed like it's a, the midnight library was symbolic of that. So what Matt is talking about, that what this story is about is a woman who, um, ends up um, killing herself. And I'm trying to be very um, conscious of how I'm wording this. So if I make a mistake, I apologize, because I am trying I am trying to be very conscious of this, this, this um, topic. But she ends up killing herself and going into the Midnight Library. Um, and in the Midnight Library, she meets a woman who is kind of her guide through the library and the library in the library, she's able to select different books that would give her a different outcome to the life she had lived. Yeah. So it's, it's like, if, you know, it's like we live our life and any one choice we make will change the progression of our life. And the midnight library is that for her. It's like, she's able to see what would have happened had she made one different choice. This is, you may have married this person. You may have had this life. You may have been a scientist. You may have been someone famous, or you may have lived the ordinary life that actually is the extraordinary life. Um, and that's what this life, this book is about. And um, it was quite profound, especially when you realize Matt Haig's journey. He's very yeah. open about his journey with mental health and his own journey with suicide and uh, attempting suicide and what that means um and he talks i think that's the the beauty of his books and the beauty of who he is um he's talking so openly about it which allows all of us the opportunity to talk about it and be open about our own struggles um and i would suggest he's a beautiful follow on on um social media so i'm actually glad you did this one first because I have a lot to say about it whereas some of the other ones I'm going to struggle a little bit more but yeah I don't <laughs> I know think we, we're about time to move on to the next book but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you did this one first this is near yeah. and dear to my heart and I'm such a fan of his what who would you say are the kind of people who shouldn't read this book um who shouldn't you know, we, often, we, we often talk about like who a book is for but who is there anybody this book isn't for um, like you think wouldn't it wouldn't appeal to who would it not appeal to um i th i'm not sure i have an answer for that i'll be honest i'm not sure i don't ha i have an answer for that um because sometimes we don't know who something who might who could read something get something out of it who could learn from a story or even glean and heal from yeah. it 
I'm not, sh I mean, proponents to mental health discussion, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but I'm not, it's, it seems like even then it could open up discussion in that capacity. And, and this is a fictional book. So it's not that he's even completely talking about mental health. I mean, this is a fictional book. Yeah. Um, giving you the possibilities and making you aware of, you know what, every one of our choices could lead back to something. And what, what she ended up finding out in the end is, um, though she could have made all these different choices and had a different life, the life that she lived was actually the one that she would choose. Yeah. Hopefully I'm not saying too much, but it's a beautiful, yeah. I, I mean, it's a beautiful story. It's, and it's quite, I always find it quite fascinating when you, when you can read, a brand new book and get so much out of it. And you realize the author is like my age right now in this time and I'm reading this book now because we often talk so much about books, fictional books, especially that are from mm -hmm. ages old. I mean, some of my favorite authors are also British authors that are that are um, some of the older, I'm not being super professional here. <laughs> I'm being comfortable. <laughs> um, some of the age old authors who have books that we have been talking about for generations and and it's interesting to be like you know what matt haig is alive right now he's my age and he's writing this profound book that we can all heal from and it's yeah. fictional and yeah and i like i said i think it's a best-selling author um are you able to see it on amazon and read see the reviews and all of that as uh, you do the I show am, or do it? yeah i'm not going to do that right now because that involved me a lot of screen share <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what I do. But uh, yeah, I'll be ready for the next book. I am. I'm, I'm going to get my phone out and I apologize somewhat, but I need reminders on some of these. So I'm just going to have my phone out okay. so I can look them up with you. So the next one is by Glenn and Doyle, who I've heard of. For ages, I thought it was a man. Untamed. Stop pleasing, start living by Glenn and Doyle. This is another book I read. I read Glennon Doyle and no, my boyfriend did not read this one to me. Oh. <laughs> I actually, I read this one alone, alone and I still am going to pull it up, but I read it during lockdown and it was so good. The, the, my best, my favorite books, you know, they really touched my heart is the more they're underlined, outlined, have stars and hearts and rainbows around it. Dog eared um, means that I got more out of it and i thoroughly enjoyed it so i read this during lockdown the reason i'm not looking at you is because i'm looking it up as i'm talking to you yeah, you paperback reader or you kindle reader? this one was this one this particular one is hard uh hardcover that oh, i purchased yeah, yeah um sometimes i'll get the paperback simply because it's less expensive sometimes i'm very aware of like books to me are treasure I don't know about you, Tim, but books to me are like they're absolute treasure. It doesn't mean I don't thoroughly outline, underline again. That means that I got more from it if I do that. But sometimes I want the hardback, the hard, is it hardcover? Is that how you say it? Yeah, hardcover. Um, so this one was, this one actually is currently number 10 this week. I'm looking it up on Amazon for you. <laughs> yeah, it's still number 10. I read it during lockdown. It was very healing and profound. Um, it's talking about reclaiming it's, it's very much written for women, though. I know men can get a lot out of it because it's another healing book. This one is not fictional. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, written in small stories that happened throughout her life and lessons she learned from them. Um, and it helps a woman reclaim her power. Um, and it was during, I read it during a time that I was healing and actually going through my own healing journey with trauma therapy. Yeah. Because a lot of people um, during lockdown, including myself, suddenly realized, wait, I have some healing to do. We're stuck inside and all of it's coming crashing down. So I read it in the midst of lockdown and in the midst of my own healing journey. And I'm reading some of the, the things that are being said about her and I won't read those out loud because I'm not sure what 
you're allowed to read out loud on here yet. I don't know if you know, but we'll learn, I guess, over time. But um, it was named by Oprah, one of the books of the year. Mm -hmm. I'm reading this right here. It's been talked about by some of the best authors around. Il Elizabeth Gilbert, I don't know if you know, remember her from Eat, Pray, Love. She uh, wrote a raving, mm -hmm. she wrote a raving review about it. Um, one of the stories that stands out to me is actually, I think it was in the very beginning of the book. She writes, she begins the book with writing about her experience of going to a zoo and seeing, uh, witnessing a cheetah in action. And what, I hope I'm doing justice to this, but what she witnessed from the cheetah was the zoo had tried to tame a cheetah. Yeah. But she could see that the cheetah always had that wild longing for what should be outside of the zoo, right? The cage of the zoo. And she she related that to to us. What happens when we finally live our authentic self, untamed, which goes along with the whole cheetah story? What happens when a woman finally stops allowing the world to dictate who we are and what we're going to do, and we live untamed? Um, yeah. Because so many of us feel trapped by the story of this is what you should do and this is who you should be. And if you don't do that, you're not living according to society's rules and all that. But what if we we look into our heart and finally be who we, who we should be and who we, feels authentic to us? So the cheetah story was very, very profound. And if you follow her, I'm a big fan of both her and her wife and yes. the things they talk about. They both are just such healers. And I follow even their podcast. Um, and they're so open about their healing journey and they're so open about being authentically who you are. Um, both have such beautiful stories. Her, her wife is a retired professional soccer player or in your world, football player. Yeah. Uh, one of the best in the world. Um, and so they're a beautiful couple just bringing people on their healing journey. And I don't, I don't know, I don't have much more to say about the book other than it was profound. It was extremely healing. Like I said, it's a number one best-selling book for a reason. Um, I think it made number New York Times best-selling books immediately, very fast, in the midst of lockdown. Mm, um, well, so I can understand, actually, because I think a lot of people have taken out or locked down the whole process of the fact that their lives need to change. So um, I can understand a book like this would be uh, especially popular. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny because a lot of, I saw a couple authors release books in the midst of lockdown and their fear was that they can't do the normal author tours and normal book tours and normal yeah. like selling my book. And so a couple of them did become this one in particular I kind of watched the process and some other people say, how are we going to do my book tour? How are we going to do my book release? We can't have the normal. And so to see Glennon's pure joy when her book hit number one, best-selling off best-selling um, New York times bestseller, however you say it um, was really fun. And the thing is it touched people, all people around the world, all kinds of women from all walks of life, who could relate in some capacity. Yeah. So I, the, the starting with these two books, these are such healing books and those are my favorite kind of books to read for That's some fun. reason in this time of my life, I'm not as drawn to fictional books. Yeah. Um, so reading Matt Haig's book was a little bit different, but um, there was a time in my life where I was very drawn to fictional. In fact, I didn't tell you this, Tim, but, I'm a big fan of the Iliad and the Odyssey. I love those books and I've loved them since childhood. I should have told you those too, but. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I tried reading, um, the Iliad's quite hard to read actually in some ways. The Odyssey's, I mean, they're both fantastic stories, but they are quite hard. They are books. <laughs> I, I haven't really read any of these books, but some of them might make my, uh, I, I tend to listen to audio books actually, so I might listen yeah. to the library or something like that. And this one actually sounds really interesting. 
Oh, are you a fun. fan of Are you a fan of mythology at all, or? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of what I've um, a lot of the Greek mythology stuff, obviously films and TVs and the like, rather than yeah. going to the original. I tried reading uh, Plato's The Republic, and even though I got through it, it's uh, it is one of the most hard to read books. <laughs> right. The only book that I, one of the books that I tried to read that I gave up on was Ulysses by James Joyce. Okay. That very high church um, sort of literary stuff. Yeah. So, um, are we ready to go on to the next book, which is going to be Man's Search for Meaning? It's one I've actually heard of, but again, not read. <laughs> yeah, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. This is a book that I sat down to read and I knew was going to be profound based on who um, put it on their must read kind of books throughout the ages. I believe I may have come across it from Oprah's, I follow Oprah's must read book oh, list. Yeah. What is her? I don't remember what it's called. It's like your her must read book list. I don't know. And she, she does have, yeah. she does bring on the best, uh, some of the best, authors that you can possibly imagine and there's quite a few that i want to read simply because of her recommendations and her reviews and their stories mm -hmm. victor frankl i think may have been one of them i'm not positive though he was on my radar for a long time i finally got the book and it was one i started before lockdown and then once lockdown came i had it so i pulled it off the shelf and started highlighting it's another book where i had highlighted dog-eared and ironically it came up again i told you i was in um a conference this past week and it was taught by part of it was taught by a beautiful older jewish woman and she brought this book up quite a bit as one of her resources yeah and so uh, victor frankl is a world was a world renowned psychologist and you know he was alive up until somewhat recent history um but he was a world a renowned um psychiatrist actually i think not a psychologist um and he based a lot of his studies on his experience in um i believe he was in auschwitz um so during the war i believe it was auschwitz i might be wrong and it may have been several internally well, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it really matters which is yeah really yeah yeah so he bases cool his, it was. It's, uh... he bases a lot of studies on his experience there and he based on okay he some of his studies are based on who survived and who didn't and why that is yeah. and that touched me a lot because i was struggling with the word hope and i still am to be real honest um, and it's hope is one of those words that maybe we'll never have an answer for. It's just one of those things you talk about and you, you consider in your heart what that means. And you know, what's funny is actually the first time we decided to do our own oh no show, I think you were talking about hope. Oh. This was the, the subject of something we, we kind of went deep before we decided to do the oh no show. And I think hope was the topic. And I think you were telling your own story and journey a little bit. You, you don't remember, but. Do you remember? No. <laughs> you did. You talked about a little bit of what hope meant to you in your own journey. Yeah. Um, I remember this. Um, but Victor Frankl talks about hope. And one of the things he said was the people who completely lost hope are the ones who passed away first. And for me, hope has always been something it, again, it's a learning journey. For me, at one point, it was, I hope that a certain outcome is going to happen, and I'm placing all my hope and trust in that outcome happening. And I've learned that that's not what hope is. Yeah. And it's interesting in the book because part of his hope was in the belief that his wife was still alive. And when he got out of the camps, he learned that she wasn't, but he had those stories to cling to throughout his entire journey in the camp. Um, and his journey in the camp was, he was, 
he was actually a doctor there and he was helping people with, even within the camp. He had mm. high ranks within the camp being a prisoner within the camp, but he's still within the camp, had high, high ranks there helping people. Um, and he was well-respected within the camp. And so the book is eventually after he was freed, um, he was able to use his experiences and become a counselor and do a lot of um, studies based on that. And I thought that was really, really interesting. I mean, for me, it was like, you hear stories like that. People share their stories so that one, they can heal and others can heal. Yeah. And so to hear a story like that, it puts life into perspective, I think. Yeah. I think that's the, the thing about a lot of these. Uh, I mean, it's the same with the film like Schindler's List and the rest yeah. of it. The people just need that historical perspective. So, uh, I mean, and we've, we've talked about that a little bit, Tim. Like, how many times do you say, you know, we've gone through history and stories and we've lived yeah. through worse, to be honest? We've, we don't know this. We don't have this. Our generation doesn't have that yeah. to relate to. Yeah, I mean, when they're broken their toenail or whatever, I mean, that's it's a spurious example, but for some people, that's I mean, I think that's one advantage of when you get older in a way, is you have more of that experience to go back on. When you're younger, everything is new and like uh, all of the bad things are all the first time you've ever experienced it, but when you get older, you can get more complacent. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't we don't have anything to relate to where maybe our grandparents could say, yeah. I well, lived through two wars or three yeah. wars, or I don't even know anymore. I mean, in America, it could be three or four wars. Well, I um, mean, people, people in the early 20th century, it was World War One, which was terrible. Then you had the Great Depression, which was terrible. Then you had World War II, which is terrible. So, uh, however, and then afterwards, I mean, people don't appreciate the Cold War was actually, uh, in many ways, still, I mean, I remember being in the eight, early 80s and as a child being worried about nuclear oblivion. Um, I mean, that was uh, the four, I mean, we had the four minute warning in the UK as opposed to 15 minute warning in the US. But we had a whole, generation that grew up with the impending threat of nuclear oblivion yeah so, you're right uh, that's, quite, that's quite trauma inducing i forgot about that we did we grew up in the 80s in a time where we were terrified yeah. of what could possibly happen now we're terrified mm -hmm. of the virus so no, <laughs> kind of like, yeah. um anyway shall we move on to the next book yes reader by um i'm gonna butcher his name paolo is it paolo cool Coolo, I've got Wallo, Wallo. I don't know if I'm even saying it right. Um, and I'm gonna look this one up as well. This I've been having, I keep referring back to this past week because it was another healing journey, and I've been having a profound um healing experience this past week in the arts, in creativity, in dance, in philosophy, and I kept thinking of Brida. Rita, again, I can pronounce it as well as you can, uh, by Paula Coelho. And my experience reading his books has been very spiritual for me. And I think that might be his intention. Yeah. Um, and Brida, Brida was one of those. And I related to the, exper the spiritual experience I had this past week to my reading of this book. And I'm going to be honest again, this is a book that my boyfriend read to me. <laughs> so. no, yeah, like James has been your cheap version of Audible really, hasn't he? So. It does. Well, okay. And let's talk about Paulo Coelho. Most of his books are about a mystical, perhaps all of them, I don't know, but they're about a mystical spiritual experience that the, the main character goes on. And it's funny because, so these are fictional books, which again, I'm not always drawn to, but I love the spiritual mystical aspect of Paulo Coelho's journey that he takes us on. And sometimes his books make me really angry in the beginning. 
Yeah, it well. takes me through. It takes me through like a complete emotional ex experience with the main character, and some of the characters I start off not liking at all because he writes. He writes some of their personalities very, very powerfully and real in a certain way. And it makes me angry that they're behaving a certain way towards a certain person or mm -hmm. they come across as um, rude or snarky or whatever. And then there has, there's only been one book of his that I'm not even going to mention that I actually did not like. Um, and I'm, it's not because it was a, bad book it's because my emotions got in the way yeah. but but by the end of most of Paulo Coelho's books I'm in love with the main character and I finally understand the journey that they've they've gone on and I'm almost hesitant to talk about the storylines because I don't want to give away the stories but um, this is one by Paulo who brings you on a mystical spiritual journey of her own she has to choose uh, between two possible uh, soulmates. And, and it does talk about the possibility of having more than one soulmate in this lifetime. I don't adhere to everything Paulo, Paulo writes about, but I love the journey that he takes us on. Um, and this is this can be a little bit controversial because it talks about a woman coming of herself um, it includes love stories. It includes all the passion. It's very descriptive in that. And her spiritual journey takes her into becoming a witch. Yeah. Um, and it could be pagan, perhaps. Um, but it's a woman becoming herself and finding herself. And it includes many spiritual practices. And you can you can kind of see now, Tim, what I'm drawn to and, and what feeds my soul. <laughs> so so well, this was, you're, you're running a coven there. In, uh, in so there. pretty much, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Run while you can. Gone, but you kill the other two sisters off. So. <laughs> Run while you can. Right, while you can. I don't know. I feel like you hit 40 and you hit 40 and it's like, we, we have this profound realization that we've already lived half our life. Yeah. And so whatever our journey is now, it's going to be our own. Um, and for me, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be me and who I am. And these books are very much healing and part of me finding myself at 40 and finally saying like, this is who I am. This is my place in this world. And Brida symbolizes that for me. Um, it was a very spiritual book for me. Um, the most, Polo Polo is known for The Alchemist. Yeah. Have you read that? No, of course not. Okay. He's, that is his, that's the book. If you that's say That's his Polo, signature Polo, work, is it? But. It's his signature work. It's, it, it's the one that everybody knows about. It's the one that everyone talks about. And in fact, I think it might even be on my list. But I'm just going to say this no, because you didn't you didn't put that on there. Oh, I didn't put Alchemist. Well, on. Well, I think we got two coming that are also parallel. Uh, okay. The Alchemist. So. Okay, I didn't. Okay, I I think I probably wrestled with that one. But the Alchemist. Can I tell you a story? I, I'm gonna. I want to try to drag this out for us because I want to see how long we can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anybody like this, the <laughs> subtext of this is that the way that the Amazon Live Influencer Program works is that you have to, you have to like stream for a certain amount of time before you get up to various levels. Yeah. yeah. 90 minutes. Um, now, I've already done half an hour, so I think if we can go an hour, I think we're... You'll be uh, good. You'll be good. I can, I can help you drag this <laughs> out, but I have stories because this is, this is books talk to me and 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 we can do this um my my by the way my amazon lives it took me i think seven because i kept doing 15 20 minute segments yeah. um but they want they actually want you to go longer um, um how can people find you on amazon well, live if they uh want to watch i them? don't know <laughs> Insider now, so I should probably share my link. Did I share it with you? Are you able to put uh, it in the comments? Yeah. Well, there isn't 
uh, yeah, it's all it, it, it's a great platform in many ways. I like the fact that like uh, anybody who's watching it, um, I have forgotten to move. Like you're supposed to press on the bottom of it on the phone, so I forgot to put the man search for me now up as the one. So I'm putting that now if anybody was going to rush it. It oh, yeah. but i mean you can just scroll across to find the books so it's not exactly a massive uh thing but yeah i forgot to switch books the last couple of times oh yeah i i keep doing that too with the switching of the okay so tim i think it's what is that amazon.com forward slash live forward slash shop forward slash christelle loren something like that yeah. um but my show is I don't want you to make fun of me. Fasten your seatbelt. It's plant-based and hungry. I decided I was going to um, focus on a part of my life that is plant-based and another discovery over the past, what, five, six years and um, see if I can do a whole entire show on that. And so I'm focusing on plant-based and that leads into healthy eating. It leads into books I've read. It leads into why my journey is where it is. You, you haven't put any healthy eating uh, plant-based books on here. And I didn't. Nah. Oh my oh. word, I didn't. The, the, for, the very first book that I read in this whole journey was The China Study, oh. which was a study based on some of the most healthy people in the entire world, people in China eating and having a certain kind of diet that was plant-based. And scientists have studied studied um, why. And so that was my very first book I read probably six years ago, introduced by family members um, that had all gone plant-based and eventually vegan, which I'm, I, I don't call myself vegan because um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I don't, but I do try to be as plant-based as possible. I feel better. Um, when I eat plant-based. So that's a book. I don't know if you're able to pull up books as you're talking to me. Um, well, I, I theoretically I can, but I'm a bit worried to go back on the phone and try to add it in as a product because then I might end the stream accidentally. Yeah, I think there. I think our friends we know that pull up things as they're doing it, they have two people kind of helping with the... Yeah, I mean, that's just... I mean, not meaning to criticize the Amazon platform, but you have to do it all on the phone at the moment. And it's oh, okay. So I've got the phone here. Uh, though Jim Hughes gave me a great tip. He was, uh, well, he actually, he actually has it on a different monitor, the comment screen, but I put my phone on a little stand up so I can see that nobody's commented. Two people are watching, apparently. So, Hi, uh, what are you reading? Tell us what you're reading and what your favorite books are. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, want to well, know. Well, <laughs> we won't add them in for the stream. Anyway, should we get on with the next book, which I think is by the same author? Okay, 11 minutes. minutes. This, was, this was actually the first book James and I ever read together, 11 Minutes. And it's a beautiful love story um, that helped me fall in love with Paulo Coelho and his work. And I don't think 11 Minutes is talked about the way some of his other work is talked about. I haven't, at least I haven't heard of it talked about in the same ways, but it was the first book that we read together. It had a lot of symbolism that related to our own lives and our own journey. And it's a love story that, again, Paulo is a bit controversial in how he derives his love stories and the possibilities of what where love might come from. Yeah. And um, this is one of those stories. And so is it's definitely that the, the storyline is a love story. When I am reading a love story, or in this case, having it read to me, <laughs> it's, I am always cheering for the happily ever after. And yeah, I think most people do in, in the romance story one. I, I don't want that. So once I, if I start, this is the journey Paulo takes us on. I mean, I feel the whole story. I, he has us feeling every moment of the story mm -hmm. to the point of evoking emotions, every emotion, anger, sadness, the, the relief of the happily ever after. And I think one of his books did not, <laughs> did not end up the way I wanted it to. And I was really upset about that, yeah. but, <laughs> but that's good. That's a good storyteller. 
Um, and so this was a beautiful love story that did end in a happily ever after in the way that I wanted it to. I'm a selfish reader. Sorry, Paulo. But um, his books are, as far as I know, never based in America. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. They're based on stories around the world. He writes himself into some of the stories. Some of the oh. stories are his own journey. Yeah. Maybe that's what we all do, but some of his stories are his own journey. I wouldn't be surprised to find out he had a similar love story at some point in his life. And, um, but 11 minutes, again, I struggle with how much to say, but 11 minutes is a beautiful love story of something you wouldn't necessarily expect. And um, why, it does. Why, why is it called 11 minutes or does that spoil the story? Or don't you know? <laughs> I'm forgetting. No, there's a reason why it's 11. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Okay. No, I actually do know. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> I'm a little yeah. bit shy about certain certain um, subjects. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a duration yes. of something. Okay. At my oh, discretion. No. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Shall we go on to his next book? Which I, think, I think this is the next one. Is, yeah. The Witch of the Portobello. Witch of Portobello. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Again, this was a profound spiritual journey, and I could relate to some of this one because the main character is a woman again. And, you know, I actually find it quite interesting when male authors are, to, are able to write about the emotional experience so beautifully of a woman. Matt yeah. Haig is one of them. He wrote The Midnight Library. It's based on the primary character being a woman. And here we have Puello Puello, where I have yet to read a book where the main character is not a woman. And he's able to reach into her soul and tell her emotional journey of, of um, life and loss and growing and growth. And, and how these men are able to do that, it's quite beautiful. Yeah. Maybe they have nothing to hide the way that a woman has been taught to hide her soul for so long. I, I'm not sure why that is. I would love to be able to talk to him and ask him so many questions. But um, I immediately related to to the, the main character's story because she found herself in the beginning of the book um, unable to partake in the religious ceremonies within the church because yeah. of of um i don't remember if it was pregnancy or divorce or both but it was because of that and and that immediately captured my attention because i have a very similar experience and journey and um we were able to all of his characters are eccentric and their growth is eccentric and so they grow spiritually and uh, mentally in very eccentric ways and so the witch of portobello is one of them and she has to find healing outside of the church and she goes to um possibly unusual places to find that healing and she finds freedom she ends up finding freedom in dance yeah and a certain kind of dance and she's able to tap into so much mystery that people are drawn to her and she gains a lot of attention because of the mystery that she taps into. Um, she brings healing to many people that come in contact with her, but you also see portions of the book where she um, human emotion such as jealousy is there and we can all relate to that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's another beautiful story that at times he taps into things that are uncomfortable because it's so relatable. Yeah. Um, and yes, this is another one of my favorites of his. And there were times that made me really angry, even with the main character. I didn't like how she came across. There were parts that my emotions went to anger and hurt, but I think that's because I can relate so well to so much of it. Um, and again, I'm gonna relate to my own life. This past week in my own spiritual journey, um, I got to do, got to take part in something called Eurythmy, which is 
a form of movement and somewhat dance movement, somewhat dance. Um, and, and both Brida and the witch of Portobello, I constantly kept thinking about those books and how women were able to find healing and freedom and courage and centering in that. Um, I was constantly reminded in the midst of doing Eurythmy with, with the people I was with. And so these Polo Colo's books mean even more to me because of my own spiritual journey. But um, so yeah. I think this is the last of his books that uh, we've got on the list. Which of those would you say is the best book for somebody to start with out of reader? 11 minutes. And this is the last one. <sighs> Everyone says books. to read. Yeah. yeah. I should have given you The Alchemist. Here's the thing. Here's the truth of the matter. Everyone says to read The Alchemist first. Yeah. I personally, when I first read The Alchemist, wasn't able to finish. I don't know why that it was. Yeah. I don't know. You know how sometimes in your life you can pick up a book and you're unable to read it. And then there's another time in your life and you can pick up the same yeah. book and you can't put it down. So that was The Alchemist for me. I read it a second time with James and it was a much more beautiful experience and I got it that time. Maybe the first time around I wasn't able to. Um, the Alchemist by Paulo. Paulo was a book that was given to my son, my middle son. This is a story I wanted to tell you. Um, it was recommended to my middle son and yeah. when he was in high school and this is how it was recommended. Um, my, I sent my children, my two oldest boys to an unusual school in that professors from San Diego State University founded this school to teach literacy and to allow students the opportunity to work, to work as they were going to high school, be interns in hospital facilities. Yeah. And these, these, the leaders and the teachers of this school were very, very um, into wanting to build relationships and believing that was part of the learning process. And they had a profound impact on the students there. And my boys were in the midst of their own journey of a story that I've talked about previously. But, but one of the founders of the school invited my son to come with him and be part of a conference where he spoke to other educators um, about the importance of literacy. So it was a literacy con conference for um, educators. And so he invited my son to be part of that experience. And he said, I have one, you, there's one thing you have to do though, if you're going to join me on this, and that's you, you have to read a book and you have to be willing to talk about it hmm. and in front of these educators. And I think my son was a, a junior in high school at that point. He had. My son was not a reader. He did not read, he, he hated reading. And he told him to read The Alchemist. You have to read The Alchemist and you have to be willing to talk about it. It's the first book my son ever read um, and he enjoyed it. Mm. So me saying that it was, it's not necessarily the first book that I would recommend. It is a book that every many, many, many say to start with. And my own son, it was the first book and may have be still to this day, the only book he's ever read. I don't yeah. know, but, um, the alchemist was it and he was able to get up and talk about it in front of educators and answer questions about it and educators asked questions about it. And so I want to be able to say that alchemist for me, Brida was my, is still my personal favorite. It, it right. took me, it, Brida, Brida, I'm not sure how you say it, was my personal favorite, probably because of where I am in my life. For me, it was like, like a, um, it was like a Bible, if I can say that to my spirit. Um, I healed through it. I'm still healing through it. I'm still relating to it. That was my personal favorite, Brida. Um, 11 Minutes has special meaning to me just because it's the first book that I read with my boyfriend and we read together um, and it's a beautiful story. So for me, I would say Brida and then 11 minutes for my own personal reasons. Um, most people would say The Alchemist, I think. Okay. Shall we go on to the next book? Which is not like yes, that. I don't even, I have no idea what it's going to be. A oh, okay. A Thousand Mary Mornings. Oliver. A Thousand Mornings by Mary Oliver. Are you familiar with her work? No, of course not. 
feel, okay. I do feel like an ignoramus sometimes. I mean, like I work a lot with authors and other people. I, I, I've read a, a lot of the literary stuff. I should have done. The 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 Mary Oliver is a poet. Yeah. And I'm pulling up one of her po her poems that is. It was wild geese that first turned me on to her work. It was wild geese. I don't think I'm. A, I wish I could read it. But I have a feeling we're not allowed to read it on here. Um, but it was wild geese that first turned me on to her work. It's the poem that most people are familiar familiar with and would recognize. Yeah. And it's what got me going to bookstores and pulling her books off the shelf and wanting to read her poetry. Um, so is this poetry. a collection, collection of poetry? It's it collections one? of poetry, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because I think we we interviewed Orna Ross. And yeah. it, is her claim to fame poetry? Uh, was that her original? Things, yeah, she's a poet. Uh, and was that her original world? Was it writing poetry originally? Yeah. And then she moved into other. So that's interesting to me. So Mary Oliver has written many collections that are books, poetry put into books. And A Thousand Mornings was the first book of hers that I ever purchased. And I fell in love with her poetry. Poetry, she relates, it's mostly about nature. Yeah. It's mostly about human emotion evoked through nature. It's profound human experiences written using nature as symbolism. And yeah dip in and dip out book I you can dip in and read a poem and then or is it have to be read from cover to cover no not at all no there's there some of them are one sentence some of the, the oh, poems okay. are one sentence yeah. some of them are several pages um but it was a thousand more uh I'm sorry it was wild geese that first turned me on to her and um she's only I believe she's only recently passed away she was a, a very well-known American author for years um she's helped many people heal and i think that's what poetry does i suppose poetry art music she's one of the greatest poet poets of all time i would say um yeah, so yeah i i that's actually a book that i do have not out in my garage and i've i moved recently so most of my books are in my garage and i wish i could hold up the books but they're packed away and that's one i actually have on my shelf next to me. So um, I'm not gonna stand up and go grab it, but it's highlighted and earmarked and um, I love poetry. So Mary Oliver, it, it, she's a poet. Yeah, we've got a new following, Ronnie Parks is started following. So thanks for following Ronnie. And uh, should we go on to the next book? Yes, please. I, again, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh... That's the, the fun of this format, uh, Humankind which I've heard you talk about quite a lot. I have talked about this book um, so many times because it was another book I read in the midst of lockdown, but guess what? I'm not actually the one who read it. It was my boyfriend reading it to me because he became a proponent of Rutger Bregman and his findings and what his books are all about. And he was he was so enthusiastic about humankind and what it found um, that he wanted to read it to me and it was yeah. one of the possibly one of the first books we read I don't quite remember but we read it in the midst of I feel like I feel like um, the virus has brought us through different stages and we read this in the midst of you remember in the beginning when. Um, communities were gathering together and helping each other. Yeah. We're not doing that anymore. Just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> we're not hearing <laughs> those. Stories. about a month and then it, everybody started going back into it. Well, they started dividing into new new groupings. Uh, there was a yeah, we've had team. like, we've had different stages of this. The state, the first stage of lockdown and freak out and either gathering too many things or helping your neighbor. There was just all these different stages uh, where yeah. we saw humans responding in different ways. And well, anyways, we read this book shortly after lockdown, if I remember correctly. And it does. It's nonfiction, is it? Or fiction? No, it's a study of human, hu humankind in the midst of 
maybe trauma or trauma stories or how his belief is that humans are inherently good. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to, um, the good is going to outweigh the bad. One of the stories that he tells is, um, is it called Lord of the Flies? No. Is it called? Well, that is a book. That's, That's a book, book with the children on the island who all go and turn into savages sort of thing. Okay. That's based on a true story. And he, one of the stories he tells is that in that the children um, actually helped each other survive. And he shows that the good outweighs the bad and people are actually there to be community and to help each yeah. other. And one of his big theories within the book is we will know of a story based on what media, what media says. Yeah. And what we don't hear about are the little stories that are happening within the communities and those good stories that are happening because the mm. media wants to focus on, maybe it's not even the big picture now that I'm thinking about it, but they wanna focus on what's going to get them the most viewers. And, and that's so not, it's controversial, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. And so the his controversial big, ones that are the uh, not necessarily the happy stories. Absolutely. And so what he did is he went in and researched some of the big stories that we may know about through maybe even generations and found little stories that were happening within and found actually this is the good that was happening. And this story wasn't told. Yeah. And it was, and also stories throughout history are told from whoever it is has the, the pen and the voice. Yeah. And that's not always the authentic story. And that's the basis of this book. And it was a beautiful book to read in the midst of um, lockdown. I believe we read it when we were actually locked down and couldn't move. Um, and so it's a fairly new book. It became a best bestseller. I believe the author is from... He's not American. He's from, um, oh gosh, where's he from? Newfoundland or, uh, oh. he's from, he's a European um, author. Oh, um, it sounds German or Dutch or something like that. But I'm forgetting, where he's, yeah, I'm forgetting where he's from. A lot of his stories were doing studies that of stories that happened in America. Um, and, What's really interesting is to hear him to hear him in interviews because he's a bit controversial, but I, I'm drawn to his philosophy and what he thinks and the studies he's done because it rings true for me. Um, I highly, highly, I think everyone should read this book and I get my, my uh, thought on that based on my boyfriend being a huge proponent of this book. In fact, actually, I forgot about this. He ended up doing a review on the book and having it published in a UK journal of some sort oh. um, because he loved the book that much. And I think this is a really good time for everyone to pick up Humankind. And it's Humankind, a hopeful history. And... So it's a hopeful spin on history then. It's a Absolutely. Go all of the stories that you don't hear from all of these bad and other events. And it reminds us of the goodness, goodness in humanity. And often the goodness is happening in the underground and in the unheard. And that's why humanity can keep surviving. It's because of the people who are doing things behind the scenes that you don't hear about. Yeah. And you hear, again, you hear about the big, ugly nightmare stories because of the biggest voices but the underground people the underground stories are what keep keep us going and thriving and so this is a great time in history to read humankind a hopeful history um he's written two books both are great um i only read the other one part way through it's again it's in my garage somewhere and i want to read that as well but I even highly recommend following Rutger Bregman. He's a he's a, on the fringes and he's a great follow um, for the world. Most of these authors are not American authors that I'm reading, so um, it's great. We can 
introduce them for the entire world to read and it's relatable okay and we have one last book uh, which you added on at the last minute so i don't know if you read it yet. was this the one that i said i want to read yeah uh, <laughs> tattoos on the heart by gregory boyle which one is it tattoos on the heart by gregory boyle ah yes 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 you know what i added this because of a twitter discussion i had and so in the midst of the conference I was at this past week, the one of the ladies that was speaking said a quote by him. So I put the quote on Twitter and I said it was Gregory Boyle. And suddenly it became a discussion of people who had read Tattoos in the Heart. Oh, and, okay. and so this is a book that I just ordered on, on Amazon. I stuttered for a minute because I was like, wait, am I allowed to say this? Of course, I'm promoting Amazon. I can say yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered on Amazon. Um, our friends can order in your link that I believe you have here. And yeah, it I did remember to actually click on it. I've been like, I've been forgetting a lot of the time to click on the thing at the bottom to change it on, but people can just scroll left and right. They, uh... Yeah, so this, this, she quoted him, talked about what he's doing. Apparently he's from Southern California. I had not heard of him, but he's doing great work in Southern California for, for healing purposes. And so when I quoted him on, on Twitter, it became an entire discussion of people who highly recommended the same book, Tattoos on yeah. the Heart. So I can't say much about it other than it comes highly recommended and I have ordered it. It's coming in the mail and I can't Hopefully wait to read you won't it. Hate it or else this could be one of those clips that you can regret in the, in the future. <laughs> I'm going to, based on who has recommended it, I'm going to say people have recommended it to me from all walks of life and that's yeah. volume. So I'm going to say that I'm going to like it. It seems like the kind of book that I'm drawn to. And it's based on work that this man is doing in Southern California, I think in Los Angeles. Yeah. So he's, he's near me. Pastor, I think, some kind. I think he's he a must pastor. be. I don't know if he's a I Catholic priest or he's a pastor or what he is. I've tracked down an Instagram account for him, but yeah. Oh, you did? Since 2018, so. <laughs> what, is he, what did you find? What's he doing? Um, it was all about the book. So um, there was a lot of posting there. So, yeah, I'm not sure how active he is on social, but um, yeah. He's very hands-on. I love when, I love when people write about something, but they're also doing it. And you can yeah. see that they're actually in the community doing the thing they're writing about. Yeah. Um, I love that because you know they're putting actions to words and this is something I know Gregory Boyle is doing and again I, I'm, I, I'm only just now becoming familiar with his work but it came highly highly recommended by the speaker at the conference I was at because some of her findings in um, teaching and art and how she um, is part of a therapeutic healing journey for children. Um, she brought his work up and has based some of her philosophy on it. So it's beautiful. I'm, I'm going to be reading it very soon here to myself, actually. Okay. <laughs> no one's reading it to me this time. So your budget audible, which is James, right? Your own <laughs> <laughs> My own audible. Yeah. So, um, right. We've got the last section, which I, which I actually, which is... Amazon dream list pick. So I asked you, uh, and it's a, it's a sign of how modest you are that you didn't go for a Rolex or something like that. Uh, I asked you, like, if you could uh, be bought anything from Amazon uh, that uh, was uh, like anything from the Amazon dot com thing, and you you gave me a vague <laughs> thing. Uh, I have this like so. Um, you said a mountain bike. So wh why didn't you go for a Rolex or something like that? Uh, it's, oh, I, I think it's actually that you're just a very practical person in a way. Um, I mean, the excuse for me having this on, on the show is that it gives me a chance to actually have a high value product that I can buy. On it. I wanted but, to, I wanted to say something really expensive for you, but I really couldn't justify. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't justify it in my own mind. So my first answer was 
Do they sell travel on Amazon? I don't even know. I don't think they do. I mean, I didn't spend any time uh, looking into it. I don't. I mean, they do travel products, but they don't yeah. do travel as such. They've not. Uh, I'm surprised. And then I thought, I well, they got Airbnb but... or something, then maybe they would. But I don't think they do any kind of travel related stuff. That's what I was, and I assumed they probably didn't. So my second answer was a mountain bike for me and my son. Yeah. And I, why? Because to me, if, why wouldn't I say a Rolex? I don't know. I, yeah, you're right. I'm practical. I want the adventure. I want, I, I, I love adventure. I love experience. I love sharing adventure with other people. If I'm going to spend money on something, I want it to be because of an experience I'm going to have, of an adventure I'm going to have. Um, that's not to say there wasn't a time that I might like ex some kind of ex expensive jewelry. Yeah, I'm not that. I, I I'm not in that space anymore. And that's not to say that people who enjoy that are wrong and they shouldn't. It's just that I love to place my money in experiences yeah um, to me experience is what's valuable to me the most valuable thing are spending time with people and creating memories and so a mountain bike represents that because there was a time where i was able to go bike riding with my children and i have memories around that and i love it and so like i said if there's anything that I could get for free it would be a mountain bike and they're not cheap how much is this one that you found um well the irony is that because i'm from the uk it's got this weird thing that it doesn't show me the price but on the bottom i can see it's 609 so 609 dollars for this uh mountain bike so yeah it you're right, it's not cheap um, no a good mountain bike that works well and isn't going to break on you is quite expensive so they're not they're not cheap. Yeah. And you found a Schwinn, which is one of our name brands here. Yeah, and well, I, I rated it by review, basically, because you just said mountain bike. So yeah. this is the second <laughs> highest rated. And the first one had weird big wheels, um, which may have been good or bad. But I was like, mm, OK, I'll go for the next one. So uh, I'm not the most coordinated person in the world, to be honest. And so to, to get a race bike or anything like that, there's a good chance I'd probably fall off. Anyways, I, I, I wouldn't be able to ride any kind of race bike. I'm just not coordinated, but I do enjoy a mountain bike adventure. Yeah. Um, and we have trails here. We have bike trails. We have mountain bike trails. Um, primarily, I love the memories that are formed. And so I said a, mount, a mountain bike for both myself and my son because I would love to create those memories. Um, to me, that's what is valuable and that's where treasure is. And I'm constantly asking myself, if I can leave it behind in this world, then, then there's not much value on it, I guess. And I hesitate to say that. But for me, um, if it can be a memory with someone, yeah. to me, that's treasure. So that's why I said a mountain bike. And I hope I'm not offending half the world by saying this. No, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, <laughs> it's funny because, I mean... Um... I was joking with you, you can get Rolexes for like 15,000 on, on Amazon. Um, and it's very easy to condemn people who want expensive stuff. To, to some extent, we all do the whole luxury thing a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's somebody that is the most important thing and they're, they're really into watches and that watches are the only thing they do, then it's like, well, yeah, why not? And why it not? can be, I mean, the thing is, it can be a a beautiful Rolex can be a beautiful gift to pass on yeah. to your son or to inscribe or to, so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not, yeah. it's not something I enjoy, but there's people who love that and collect them. And how much is a, a, a Rolex? If I was to go into a Rolex store, which I've never done, and now I'm curious, how um, much is? Well, I don't know specifically. I mean, I think you can get them from like thousand dollars up or something along those lines. Uh, feel free to do your own Rolex review <laughs> on, on here and hope that just one person buys a Rolex from your Amazon live channel that you can't remember what it's called. Uh, <laughs> Put the Rolex on and, and see yeah. if anyone will purchase a Rolex. Um, 
And then I couldn't, I couldn't tell you like a TV because I don't watch TV. So that wouldn't be, yeah. that wouldn't be accurate. So here we went, we got a bike and you found a beautiful one. And if anyone wants to purchase it for me, I'm fine with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, you never know. And there might be like Warren Buffett might start watching the show and then go through and buy all of the guests, the dream item that they had on the show. And then you'll think, why didn't I ask for a Rolex I could sell? And Speaking of Warren it. Buffett, I'm actually quite intrigued by him and his, his financial journey. He's he's done something different that I'm very intrigued by, and I wouldn't mind actually reading one of his books because he li he lives very frugally as one of the most yeah. um, wealthy men in the world, living quite frugally. Um, I'm curious about his journey, but I haven't read any of his books. I well, know that I haven't got any of his products at the bottom, so uh, so, so you don't get to talk about it. <laughs> Um, well, I think we've I think we've learned a lot both about your books, uh, your history. Uh, you like mountain bikes and uh, romantic books with uh, that aren't too. Uh, the characters don't do the wrong thing at the end. Uh, <laughs> as long as it ends in a happily ever after, I'm good. Well, I mean, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Um, I mean, that's <laughs> what lots of people do. I mean, lots of romance writers say they are particular. They can't. It, as much as they want to write like an unhappy ending at the end, they know that just doesn't sell. Um, there's an expectation in particular romance genres that there's got to be a happy ending. So, uh, dear yeah. Paula, one of your books really made me angry because it did not end in the happily ever after in the way I wanted it to, and I'm still not over it. I just, I just yeah, but the thing is that now <laughs> you know, reading the books, that you're not gonna be sure that it's gonna have an happy ending. Yeah, these books, which adds to the uh, it's not like when you're watching some TV drama and the main character gets killed, and then you know, well, they're going to be back next week. Um, yeah, that may have happened in one of the Marvel programs in the last week. Um, yeah, but they actually in the post credit scene they they uh they retcon that, so it was kind of like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Um, Isn't that what keeps you hanging on, though? Like not knowing it. Either one, it doesn't end the way you want to, so they can do a sequel. Or two, it it does exactly what the author wants. It takes well, you. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why Game of Thrones was so popular to begin with, because they did kill off like my, people you would feel would be the main character would just be killed off midstream. So um, you never could tell what was going to happen. It's not like the the usual like. Oh, this is the main character. Whatever happens, they're going to survive. It was like, no, they're just being killed off. And it's like, oh. <laughs> and then it's like the end of season. It's like, oh, everybody's died. Uh, it's not like the old uh, dynasty where they uh, they had everybody, they had a big end of season thing where they basically rearranged everybody's contracts. So yeah. <laughs> they always signed. So it's like, oh, yeah, they had terrorist attack. And then it's like, ooh. Um, anyway, before we get, like um, taken down for breaking Amazon regulations about something or other. Well, I um, mean, they sell Game of Thrones on Amazon. So you're you're gonna need to go back and click on some links yeah. there, Tim. Um, and your own books. Let's not forget your own books that you've written that are being sold sold on Amazon. Yeah. Well, at some stage, I'll have to add in my own. Uh, I might invite, invite some of the people I interviewed on the book as <laughs> so they can. Oh, yeah. actually, I could say my own, uh, uh, my own, uh, like very egotistical way of doing it, but it's been good to do uh, get this format. Uh, I was originally planning actually that each of the books would be about two minutes. I think we talked about ten minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then that's good. I mean, it's um, I'm intending to take these some of these clips and shove them onto social media, and actually some platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook, the longer clips do better. So, oh, okay, okay. You might see yourself on uh, talking about uh, all of this stuff on. Uh, well, that's great. Depending Tim, on if well, I, I want to know is to get around to <laughs> what rewatching it and clipping all the clips of this enormous epic uh, book chat live episode. I think I want to say I think you've reached ninety minutes now. Yeah, I think I've. I think I'm now going to get to the point where I can apply to be uh, <laughs> uh, Amazon you know. live something or other creator uh, druid level uh, which you are now you are now a amazon live creator person thingy and insider level up. 
I've leveled up and I'm going to need to figure out this whole thing because it's what you're doing right now is is quite hard. What yeah. you're producing right now is quite hard. So and you've told me how to do it, but I still I have to click until I figure it out. So yeah. I mean, I, I'm almost like this show in some ways could do with multiple people on it. But on the other hand, just because of the nature, it's all about clicking. Somebody's got to be paying the money from clicking down the bottom. So it's easy to do it on your own. Because that's a whole yeah. other world of splitting that money up would be a whole uh, uh, world of uh, confusion. So uh, Absolutely. Well, we know Tim and Jim are, no, who is it? Jim and Chris. Jim and Chris, yeah. Are doing a beautiful They're doing clock. Dealcasters Live. Shout out to Dealcasters Live if they're on. Anybody who's watching. Uh, I don't know if they do. Hopefully they're not streaming at the moment. I don't want to be competing with them. But um, <laughs> yeah, they do a good show. So uh, shout out to Dealcasters Live at the end. We've learned uh, a lot so, from them, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I've no idea how to link to your show. You've got to get, you've got to get a redirect link so that people can actually... Um, I need you that dot live thing, right? I need to. I need to do. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it can be any. It doesn't have to be dot live. It can be any domain no more. Just a way of like even from your own website to it would be good because it is a bit confused. It's a bit hard to find these shows otherwise. I know it is. I have the link. But I don't know where it is. <laughs> anyway, thanks to the viewers. We had one uh, another comment saying, "No, I don't read books." <laughs> the most helpful. There's um, always audio. Well, that's why my boyfriend. Oh, I mean, I listen mainly to audio books. I listen to most books on audio now. Um, you can listen at double speed. Um, I mean, books are just another form of medium. I mean, you don't have to be sitting there reading the paperback. Uh, you can be reading it on on your iPhone. I mean, I used when I used to commute in every day into London. I used to read. I I used to read books on my Kindle app on my iPhone, ebooks, and I could get through a lot of them. I think, uh, um, I mean, it's a different experience reading Lord of the Rings when you're on the tube like this with your phone, as opposed to uh, listening to an audio book or reading it sitting down on your own. Yeah. Um, but there are so many ways to read books or consume book content. It doesn't have to be. Um, so if you're not a reader, you can actually can, you can still, quotes, read books without reading books. It's, I mean, Audible is the way to do that, really, awesome. the easiest way. That's what teachers will teach, too. My One of my sons, like I said, still hates reading to this day, but they said, have him read, have him listen to audiobooks. Yeah. Have him read comic books. Listen, we can say we hate reading, but we actually read comic books or the back of cereal boxes. I don't know. And we're still reading. It's funny, actually, because uh, most of the Marvel comics that I read as a kid, now they're getting around to... I used to read all the obscure comic characters. I didn't really re realise. <laughs> so they're getting, like, the West Coast Avengers are appearing slowly in the Marvel comics now. And that was well, something I used to read as a kid. I don't know why I ended up reading the West Coast Avengers, given that I was in the UK. Um, but, you know, White Vision who was recently introduced in the TV programs is now uh, is now there. Anyway, enough of this <laughs> Um I haven't got an outro. I've got uh no, I haven't got any outro music, so I'm just gonna have to say goodbye to everybody and work at try and remember how to do do I go here or I think I'll do it on the phone first. So goodbye everybody and thanks so much for being the guest, Christelle. Tim, thank you for having me as your first guest. I hope I did not disappoint you greatly. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's like uh, you are the only, you are the both the best and the worst guest so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> right until the next guest, and I will get. I've got a few people. I've actually had people inquire about being guests on the show already. Oh, good. Um, I know it's like it's the it's the weird people want to talk about the books I read. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting concept. Anyway, goodbye, everybody. Presses the end stream button. Nothing. Happens. Oh, I was dozing, dozing off. I'm like. <laughs>